For the last several homil homilies, I've been fascinated and spoken a lot about uh, my ideas on time and space and form and how these, in some sense, are just artifacts of incarnation made up by a tiny little human mind which can't grok the entire gestalt of eternity. Um, and so I picked three little passages today, one from John's Gospel, one from Matthew's Gospel, and one from uh, Paul's letter, like the second letter to the Corinthians, showing how these ideas of time and space and even our form, our, our sense of identity, are really, really malleable. So firstly, from John chapter 8. So this is a story where Jesus claims to be older than Abraham. Now, Abraham lived 1850 years before Jesus was born. But here's what Jesus had to say. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the crowd said to him, you are not 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And in the second reading from Matthew's Gospel, it's the story of the Transfiguration, in which he encounters Moses, who was dead 1,250 years before Jesus, and Elijah, who was dead 800 years before Jesus, and in which Jesus' own physical form changes. The light being that he is shines through not just his face, but even through his garments, as if it were like some kind of a, like a dress rehearsal for the resurrection. Here's what Matthew says. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. And the final passage is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And it's a classic out-of-body experience in which Paul can't figure out whether he's in his physical body or in his astral body or in his soul self. Here's what he says. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a person is not permitted to speak. Words inspired by God. So today I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Actually, it's the same news. It just depends on you know, how you perceive it or where you are. So if you're Irish, it's good news. If you're not Irish, the news is not so good. So here it is. I'm sure you've all been brought up to believe, particularly Catholics or Christians, that there's only one gate that goes into heaven. It's called the pearly gates. And standing outside it is a very dour-faced St. Peter with a big, big book in which all the record of your entire life is written down. And Santa Claus is standing behind him, looking over his shoulder, and to try to find out whether you've been good or bad during your lifetime. And you're going to get either the thumbs up and told, okay, you can come in, or the thumbs down, and yet Peter tells you, go to hell. Now, that's what you've been taught. But the truth is, it isn't the truth. The truth is, there are two different gates going into heaven. One gate Definitely, Peter is standing there. He's got a big book with Santa Claus looking over his shoulder, you know, and he's a very critical judge. The other gate, however, is I'm going to call it the Shamrock Gate, and it's guarded by St. Patrick. And here's the backstory to it. There's a mountain in Ireland, the County Mayo. It's now called Croke Patrick, which literally means Patrick's Mountain or Patrick's Stack. It's 2,507 feet high. And in fact, just recently, an archaeological dig has established that there was a pre-Christian fort there that goes back to about 300 BCE. But St. Patrick arrived in Ireland in the year 432 AD, and he died in the year 461 AD. But in the year 441 AD, he discovered this mountain, 
I don't know what it was called before that. It's now called Cork Patrick, uh, after Patrick, Patrick's Mountain of Patrick's Stack. And he went up to the top of the mountain and he spent 40 days and 40 nights fasting and praying, just like Moses did on Mount Sinai or Jesus did in the, uh, in the desert. And he kept pestering God. And the story is that this it was from here that he drove all the snakes out of Ireland. But he kept pestering God again and again and again, and he wouldn't give up for 40 days and 40 nights until finally God gave up and said, okay, what do you want? And Patrick said, in the last judgment, when all the souls who've ever lived are standing in front of the gate of heaven, I want you to open a second gate, and I want to be in charge of it. And this gate is only for the Irish, and I'll judge the Irish. Peter can have the rest of them, but I'll have the Irish. And the very good news is, as an extra bonus, if your name begins with an O or a Mac, then he fast tracks you. So that's the backstory to it. Now, this is mountain every year on the last Sunday of July. It does a big pilgrimage. And literally thousands of people from all over the world climb this mountain. And it's really rocky and really stony. And some really hardy st souls actually go up in their bare feet. Now, I want to talk in some sense then about that. Today, as we've been told, is it's the Feast of All uh, Saints. Tomorrow is All Souls. And November the 6th is the Feast of All the Saints of Ireland. We have our own feast day on November 6th. And so I want to talk then about life beyond the veil. And if I were to give this homily a title, I would call it Piercing the, Piercing the Veil of the Illusion of an Afterlife. And I'm going to look at four different versions of an afterlife. Very briefly, I'm going to look at the secularist view of an afterlife. I'm going to look at the monotheistic view of an afterlife. I'm going to look at Eastern religions and what they have to say about it. And then a fourth one, I'm going to call it the view of the mysticist. And I'll explain that term when I get there. And then finally, I come to my own conclusions about the afterlife. So let me begin with the first one. What is the view of the afterlife, you know, of the secularists? And by secularist, I mean you know, uh, atheists and materialistic scientists and hedonists. You know, what's their thinking about the afterlife? And it's a very simple one. They don't believe in it. There is no pre-life. There's no such thing as the soul. They don't even believe in consciousness. We're just these machines. And we've got a very, very short shelf life, somewhere between typically zero and 100. And there's no afterlife. There's no past afterlife. You die, it's lights out. There's only total oblivion. And in between, you're treated to maybe 80 years of consumerism and taxes. Have a nice day. That's the secularist view of an afterlife. Obviously, I don't subscribe to that. The second view of the afterlife, I'm going to look at the great monotheistic religions, particularly Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So what do they say? They're roughly, they're in agreement on this. There are slight differences, obviously, but they're roughly in agreement. And so in this version, there is no such thing as a pre-existing soul. There's no pre-life. In the Catholic view, when a man and a woman make love and a sperm meets an egg and a zygote is created, then God says, oh, a new zygote, I better make a new soul. And God makes a new soul and he infuses it into the zygote and then life just begins at that stage, if you believe in the, kind of the Christian viewpoint. There's only one incarnation then. You get one shot at it. You only die once. And in mathematical parlance, it's like you're part of what I would call a one-sided infinity like the uh, positive integers, like uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It goes on forever, but has a beginning point. There was a zero. So it's a kind of a one-sided infinity. And in this model, after death, there's a judgment. And then there's four options, particularly in the Catholic version of it. There's heaven, there's hell, there's purgatory, and there's limbo. And it's interesting that you know, these groups can be in, co in communication with each other, in and Catholicism is called the communion of saints. But the, uh, the lexicon here is horrific. So according to this communion of saints, there are actually three groups of us. There are those who are in heaven, and they're called the church triumphant. Yeah, we made it. We made it. And then there's the church militant. That's us down here, warriors for the sake of the kingdom. We're still battling. We still don't know whether we're going to win the fight or lose the fight. And what's going to happen when we die as individuals? And then there's the people in purgatory 
and they're called the church suffering. So they're the church triumphant, the church militant, and the church suffering. And they can all dialogue with each other. They can all kind of pray for each other. And that's the notion of the communion of saints. But it's interesting, when I actually studied it, the notion of purgatory was only invented in the 13th century. There wasn't a notion of purgatory in Catholic teaching before the 13th century. In fact, reincarnation had been accepted up to the Second Council of uh, Constantinople in the year 551 AD. Uh, so purgatory wasn't invented until about the 13th century. And it was about purification, that there were some souls who died. They didn't have mortal sin, but they weren't totally sinless. So they had to suffer someplace or they had to be purified someplace. And so the church in the 1300s invented purgatory. So this like a holding area until people kind of worked off all you know, their own sins. Now, there was this great tradition then all over the Catholic world, and we loved it as kids. On November the 2nd every year, there was this protocol. I'm sure you all remember it. So if you went to a church on November the 2nd, and you said, in our Father, a Hail Mary, and a Glory be to the Father, for the Pope's intentions, you could spring a soul out of purgatory. It was called a plenary indulgence. And then you could rush out of the church, stay outside, take a breath outside, go back in again, and repeat the process. And as many times as you could go in and out of the church that day, you could get another soul out of purgatory. And I used to keep, to keep a log how many people I was freeing every year. So I'm sure you all remember that notion of purgatory. And then there was the other place, which was um, called Limbo. And this was the result of the thinking of Augustine way back in the 400s. The notion that uh, little children who died before they could be baptized, they were still subject to original sin but they hadn't actually committed any sin of their own. But since they weren't baptized, they could never get to heaven. So they invented another place called Limbo. And Limbo was a place of you know, kind of secular you know, serenity. So the, all the babies went down there if they weren't baptized. And they, but they could never get to see the face of God. And so presumably, twice a day, God sent angels down from heaven into Limbo you know, to change their diapers and to feed them. But they could never get up to heaven. And to add insult to injury, the Catholic Church, you know, took this very seriously. So between 1845 and 1847 in Ireland, during the Great Famine, when uh, about four million people either died or emigrated because of the famine, and a lot of newborn babies were dying, and they couldn't be baptized. So there were special graveyards created in Ireland. And in Gaelic, we call them Killini. And I actually lived beside one of them for several years. Uh, Killini. And Killini meant literally this tiny little graveyard. And it was a special graveyard for unbaptized babies because you couldn't put them in an ordinary graveyard. They'd contaminate the, Christ, you know, the, the baptized Catholics. So they had to be separated. So to add to the insult of famine and emigration, the newborn babies who weren't baptized had to be separated from their parents and from their families. Now, several years ago, and I never saw any announcement of it, very, very quietly, Limbo was shut down. And presumably, they bust all the kids up to heaven. So that was kind of there, the monotheistic version of what the, uh, the afterlife would look like. But there's a third version then. I call it the view of Eastern religions. What do they teach about uh, an afterlife? Religions and philosophies, particularly like uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, they talk about a pre-existing soul. There is a pre-life before incarnation begins, there's already an eternal existence of a soul. And so it proceeds in several phases. There's a pre-incarnational phase, there's an incarnational phase, there's a post-incarnational phase, and there's in between, they call it the Bardo state, life between lives leading to reincarnation. So in mathematical terminology, this would look like um, a two-sided infinity. So if you took all of the integers, not just the positive integers, so it's not just zero, one, two, three, four, five, so that once you come into existence, you continue to exist forever. But in Hinduism, you were always in existence. So minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. You always were. There was never a time when you weren't. And there will never be a time when you won't be again. So kind of a two-sided infinity. And the reason for these many, many lifetimes and many incarnations is that we have to have the opportunity uh, to deal with our karma our good karma and our bad karma. We need to have the opportunity of learning from our experiences in space suits. 
And in order to have a full human experience, you can't experience an entire human experience by just being born once in one gender, in one ethnicity, in one socioeconomic status, with one level of IQ. You haven't savored human life if that's all you've experienced. I use the example several times of a chessboard. When you play a game of chess, there are literally 10 to the power of 123 possibilities. 10 to the power of 123. That's 10 followed by 123 more zeros. That's how many possibilities there are in a chess game. But the typical chess game is over and done with in 80 moves. And the typical life incarnation is over and done with you know, 80 years or 90 years or whatever. There is no way we can understand what a human experience is like if that's all we have. And so we get as many opportunities as we can until we finally understand what human life is like and so that we can learn to be loving in all circumstances, no matter what period of history we find ourselves in, no matter what kind of darkness we find ourselves subject to, no matter what kind of personal vicissitude we're subject to, we get an opportunity in every single configuration to experience the possibility of responding anywhere with love. And there's a Buddhist version of the communion of saints, and the language actually is much nicer. It's not talking about a church militant and a church triumphant and a church suffering. They call it the Bodhisattva vow. And this is souls who continue out of compassion to keep coming back, to keep incarnating, to try to wake up the rest of us. So they keep crossing over the veil both ways, incarnation and out of incarnation until all sentient beings are saved. And for me, that's a much more enlightened version of the communion of saints because it is totally driven by compassion and by love. So that would be a kind of a third version of uh, um, life beyond the veil. The fourth version, I'm going to call it the version of the mysticist. The mysticist was a word I invented about 20 years ago. And it's a cross between a cross fertilization of a mystic and a scientist. So I call this such a person a mysticist. So that's somebody who's really well versed you know, in the scientific understanding of life and is equally versed in the mystical understanding of life. People like uh, Taylor Dasharda. Uh, Carl Jung called such people Gnostic intermediaries. Somebody who's so conversant with two different cultures or two different languages that she can cross fertilize them to their mutual benefit. That's what a Gnostic intermediary is. That is a mysticist as far as I'm concerned. Somebody who's off fair with the scientific model and is off air with mystical states and can cross fertilize both of them, like a Thailand, the Shanda. I think I met another mysticist in my life. Uh, in 1993, when I had finished the uh, study in Palo Alto of the power of intercessory prayer at a distance on self esteem, anxiety, and depression, of which many of you were a part, I was invited to uh, present my findings uh, to the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Uh, uh, in Petaluma, now in Petaluma. And this had been founded uh, by Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell was the astronaut on the Apollo 14 spacecraft. He was the sixth man to walk on the moon. And on the way back from the moon, he says he had this, to use a Hindu phrase, a samadhi experience, a radically mystical experience. Watching every two minutes, he'd see the sun, the moon, and the earth just rotating outside his space capsule. And he got this extraordinary understanding that we are all one. And so he founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences to bridge science and uh, uh, the technology of science and mysticism together. And I remember after I give my presentation, uh, we had a few minutes of conversation, just he and I, a real privilege for me to talk to this extraordinary man. And he talked about a theory he had, and he subsequently wrote a lot about it, which he called the quantum holographic theory of physics. And I'm going to very, very simply try to explain some of that. And I'm going to add in pieces of my, of my own to try to make sense of the veil and what lights beyond the veil. So um, Mitchell's notion of the quantum holographic theory of, of physics is a kind of um, like a macro version of John Bell's theorem of entanglement. John Bell was an Irish physicist who in the 1960s established that particles, once they have been in connection ever, are entangled. Even if you send them to different parts of the universe and you make a change in one of the particles, the other instantaneously changes as well, so that they're constantly entangled with each other. 
Now, um, Mitchell's version of the quantum hologram is a macro version of that. It's a belief system that at a macro level, all things, all beings are interconnected and entangled. Now, I've read elsewhere at some stage that every five minutes, the sun sends more information to planet Earth than is contained in all of the libraries that exist on our planet. And in fact, it's this information that's sent by the sun, I believe, that drives evolution on our planet. Evolution doesn't happen through you know, random mutation. Evolution happens because there are data and there's information being beamed through light by the sun onto planet Earth. And that's the, that's the real driver, it seems to me. That is the real driver of uh, evolution every five minutes. Now, we also know that all of us, whether we're animals or rocks, we're composed of atoms, which are the result of supernova explosions that happened maybe nine billion years ago elsewhere in the cosmos. And everything within us, every single atom of our being is literally stardust. So we're all connected. We are all, we are one with all that is. It's just that if I were to give it a Hindu name, Shiva is the Hindu name for a divinely driven evolution that just reorganizes the elements. So Shiva is that aspect of God that recombines the elements, the atoms of our being in such a way that, uh, the, you know, bunny rabbits are created, our mountains are created, our oak trees are created, our humans are created. But it's the same information. It's the same data. They're just juggled and configured in different ways. So we know, for instance, that all matter is simply frozen light and that photons carry information or data. And therefore, the human body, and particularly our DNA, is a receiver and a transmitter of those data and that information. And that is how evolution continues, because we're being driven by cosmic forces, physical and non-physical. In fact, I read elsewhere that uh, the same satellite communication, when we're communicating with our satellites in space, the frequency is exactly the same frequency as the frequency of our DNA. So the frequency with which we communicate with our satellites is the same frequency at which DNA molecules vibrate. And so in some senses, every molecule of our being is a receiver and a transmitter and we're constantly in dialogue with each other, with all other beings that are out there. And so for me, I would call this the unconscious version of the communion of sense. This is the unconscious beyond awareness, the ways in which we are constantly in dialogue and influencing each other. And if that's the unconscious version of the communion of sense, then prayer is the conscious version of the communion of sense. So whether or not we are aware of it and bring it to full consciousness, all beings everywhere are in communication with each other. And it's not just the church triumphant and the church militant and the church suffering. Everything that exists in the phenomenological realms is in communication with everything else that exists. And if this communication is love driven, then there is positive evolution. If this, you know, is driven by fear or anxiety or anger or unforgiveness, there's a whole different version. So data and information can have one of two effects on, you know, the receivers. It can be toxic or it can be healing. So we have to be really, really careful about the data and the information that we allow into our psyches. And we have to be really, really careful about the data that we send out and we transmit to our world and to others from our psyches and our souls. We have the ability to control what comes in and we have the ability to control what goes out. Again and again and again, Christ is reminding us that we must be transmitting and receiving at the frequency of love. Otherwise, there are karmic consequences. And when we do receive and transmit at the frequency of love, we will see our world move from homo sociopathicus to homo spiritualis. But that's gonna happen person by person moment by moment, thought by thought, word by word, and deed by deed. That, is, that for me is, I would call, the version of the mysticists and the afterlife. So here's my conclusion, and I'm going to draw heavily on my Celtic roots. We have this notion, I've spoken to you many times about it, in, in Celtic uh, mythology, we call it a chayal oith, 
and the coelloid is a thin place. It is a place where the veil between the uh, secular and the sacred, between the mystical and the mundane, is temporarily diaphanous. And if you're in that place at that, the right time, you can travel through this veil. So that could be, it could be a lake, it could be a hillside, it could be a grove of trees, it could be a fairy fort. Or I believe that there are some charismatic prophetic figures whom I would call, you know, mobile tabernacles of quail. They're quailites in motion. Wherever they go, they bring a quailite with them. Their personality and their charisma is such that they invite the rest of us to see beyond uh, the mere illusion of reality into what's really, really true. And they're the Buddha figures of our lives. They're the Jesus Christ figures of our lives. So in Gaelic, we would call that a coil oit, or I would call this a, 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 a coil dinner, a, a thin person in a sense. I also would like to talk about the notion of, I'm going to call it a coil om. In Gaelic, that would be a thin time. That there are some times which are especially diaphanous, where the veil is really, really, we can see through it much more easily. And all religions have these the sacred times, these the thin times. So, for instance, uh, in Christianity, we have Christmas and maybe Easter. These are two special times when the veil somehow is pierceable. In uh, um, Judaism, it will be Pesach. In, for Muslims, it will be Ramadan. For Hinduism, it might be Diwali. And so these are, you know, these, these are times when you can move through. In Gaelic, there are four very, very strong occasions when this is the case. And we call them Imbolc which is the 1st of February, and Bialtana, which is the 1st of May, and Lunasa, which is the 1st of August, and Samhain, which is the 1st of November, which is today. And so in the Gaelic cosmology, in the Celtic cosmology, today is a thin time, and Eucharist is a thin place. So there's this extraordinary juxtapositioning of place and time into the here and the now. What are we going to do with it? In the, in the Gaelic model, there is no fight between light and darkness. There is a dance between light and darkness. In fact, it's the darkness that gives birth to the light. And Samhain is the beginning of the dark period, the 1st of November, the beginning. We're moving into winter time and darkness. The days are getting shorter and the nights are getting longer. But it is not darkness killing or swallowing up light. It's that the darkness is the fertile, fecund womb of everything that can possibly be conceived and be born. And in the Gaelic cosmology, the goddesses are archetypes of this darkness, the darkness of the womb, the darkness of conceiving in order to give birth. And the gods in, in, in the Celtic mythology are the archetypes of wise cultures. And there's this dance between the archetype of nature and the archetypes of culture, between the darkness of the womb and the light of giving birth. And there's these kinds of realizations that allow us to pierce the veil and to dissolve the illusion of death. So if you were to ask me, somebody asked me during retreat uh, recently, do you believe in an afterlife? And my answer is very definitely, I don't believe in an afterlife because I don't believe in death. I don't believe that death ends life. For me, life is all that there is. I believe there's just one eternal, seamless, divine life that flows through all of creation in all its phases. Everything is part of that divine life of God, whether it's the mountain I'm looking at out there, whether it's the charred redwood trees out there, whether it's the bunny rabbit, whether it's a human being, whatever it is, there's only one life coursing through all of us. It's the divine life. And this divine life goes through some kinds of phases. There's a pre-incarnational phase of this life. There's an incarnational phase of this life. There's a bardo phase of this life between other lives. There's a reincarnational phase of this life, but there is only one life. So there can't be an afterlife because there only is life. Christ said very famously, uh, and, and there's a Greek phrase that captured it in the New Testament. He said, the kingdom of God is en mesoi. Now, obviously, Jesus wasn't speaking in Greek. He was probably speaking in Aramaic at the time. But it got translated into Greek as en mesoi. The kingdom of heaven is en mesoi. And en mesoi has two meanings. It means it's within you, 
and it means it's among you. And the kingdom of heaven is just another name for the divine, eternal, seamless life that has no beginning and has no end. There is no afterlife. There's only life.